We have Dane Skelton, uh, John Dane Skelton, for those of us who know him, know him as Danny. Um, Danny is uh, currently a grad student at SUNY Omega. So, welcome. All right, hello everybody. Thank you very much for coming out to my talk. Like Mark said, I'm a grad student at SUNY Oneonta right now. And as my title gives away to you, I'm gonna be talking about estimating spawning population abundance of lake sturgeon on artificial spawning beds. So with that, let's get into it. Now before we get into the nitty gritty of everything, I'm just gonna give you a brief outline of what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna give you the life history and background of lake sturgeon, and then more specifically, the population that we work with for this project. We're gonna get into the methods, results and discussion, and then our future goals. So getting into the life history, hopefully I don't sound too repetitive from our last talk, but I'll try my best to be new and creative. So lake sturgeon are freshwater fish. Now they are the only sturgeon in North America who exhibit their entire life cycle in fresh water. Obviously we have other species of sturgeon, but at some point in their life cycle they utilize salt water, making lake sturgeon very unique. But just because they live in fresh water doesn't mean they are known to move around. They do a lot. They are long distance migrants known to travel hundreds and hundreds of miles to reach spawning grounds that they access time and time again. Very important to know for later on. They're also extremely long lived. Male lake sturgeon can live up to 55 years old, which is pretty old considering most of the fish that we think about and work with. But females blow that out of the proportion. Females can live anywhere between 80 to 150 years old. So these guys are built for the long haul. And this is very important because that plays into the fact that their spawning population relies on multiple age classes. So you have some older individuals, some middle-aged ones, and then some younger adults coming in. They all play a factor in that spawning population. I'm getting more specifically into the life cycle. So lake sturgeon live a long time, but as a consequence of that, it takes them a very long time to mature. Now, larval and juvenile lake sturgeon they grow relatively quickly, but it, it takes a good amount of time for them to be sexually premature, excuse me, mature. <laughs> With males maturing anywhere between 12 to 15 years old, females anywhere to 18 to 27, so a very long time. Now they are broadcast spawners, so essentially what that means is sturgeon will stage up in really large groups and they'll kind of stay there, and it's actually the female that initiates spawning, so she'll slowly start to move up onto the spawning beds, accompanied by multiple males, and once the female releases her eggs into the water column, males release milt, fertilizing the eggs, which then fall down into the substrate, which is the next important thing for the life cycle. Lake sturgeon rely on coarse substrate. We're talking cobble, gravel, anything when it builds on top of itself, it forms large cracks and crevices. So those eggs, they fall down in between those rock layers and they adhere, they stick to the surface where they're protected from predation, high water flows, but at the same time, given ample amounts of oxygen while they're developing. Something cool about lake sturgeon, they don't spawn every year. They're actually known to take breaks. Now, how long a sturgeon's break will be depends on the individual sturgeon and the sex of the sturgeon. Shocker, males always want to get back to the spawning beds before the females do. Yeah, shocker there. <laughs> but females can take up to four years before they return back to the spawning beds. And then the spawning event usually occurs from around eh, about late March to about mid-June or so. And that plays into the management and conservation concerns. So currently, lake sturgeon are listed as a threatened species in New York State. A large cause of this is due to overfishing that New York State experienced in the past. Now, like I said, lake sturgeon live a long time, but they're late to mature as well. If you overfish and take out all of those adult individuals in your spawning population, it's gonna be a long time until you have sturgeon that are recruiting into that spawning adult population again. But more likely what's going to happen is if overfishing continues, you're gonna take out those younger individuals before they even have a chance of reaching that sexual maturity. And as you know, if you don't have reproducing individuals, it's kind of hard on your population. And I'll get more into it in a little bit, but dams are also a big threat that sturgeon face. So sturgeon have a lot of protections now, but dams provide a lot of issues for sturgeon in terms of coming back. And that's really due to loss of connectivity and habitat. So getting more specific, so 
Lake Sturgeon and the St. Lawrence River. It is one of the largest population segments in the state and one of the most stable, which is very cool, but still looking at historic records, their abundance is very low. And like I mentioned before, this is where dams play a large factor. So dams disrupt population connectivity. So if you think about it, let's just take the St. Lawrence River sturgeon population as a one big hole. You put an impassable barrier in there, you've essentially segregated that population, depending on how many dams that you put in between those populations. <clears throat> they also alter spawning habitat. Like I said, lake sturgeon travel hundreds and hundreds of miles to reach spawning habitat that they come back to time and time again. You put a wall there that you can't pass, that habitat is essentially useless to the population behind that dam. And dams also alter water flow. In some areas, they reduce water flow, so sedimentation occurs, building mucky layers, making that coarse substrate unusable to sturgeon. And then there's also scouring, large amounts of current blowing those important substrate rocks downstream or scattering to the, them to the point where that is also useless to sturgeon as well. And getting more specific, our project focus on the lake sturgeon population around the Iroquois Dam, which I'll get more into in a little bit. But that last bullet is focused on that population specifically. So DEC, looking at the total numbers of sturgeon over time, the sturgeon that come back to the spawning beds that they've been monitoring, showed some concern that the population seemed to be decreasing over time in terms of sturgeon coming back. So the study objectives here, oh, so the goal is to inform current monitoring and management of lake sturgeon recovery, develop an index of annual abundance accounting for imperfect detection within distinct population segments, or DPS as I have it up on the screen there, and then to apply this approach to find long-term trends, so over time, to this lake sturgeon population. And that brings us to our study site. So we focused on the lake sturgeon population around the Iroquois Dam, like I said earlier. Now, in 2007, the New York Power Authority created artificial spawning beds for the sturgeon to spawn on, giving them habitat. Each bed was about 30 meters by 30 meters. And let me get skip over here. So something interesting, just for you all to know as we continue this talk, the St. Lawrence River is fun because it flows from south to north. So our upstream bed is actually going to be down here. I don't know if you can see that. It's going to be down here and then the downstream bed is gonna be up there. So <laughs> just important to note for later on. <laughs> and then after 2007 and 2008, monitoring of the sturgeon beds began, which I'll get more in specific into how they were monitored. But in 2008, monitoring started. But it was in 2011 that the project was handed over to DEC, and that's who we received our data set from. So the data we work with is from 2011. 